Hi, everybody. My name is Veronica obregon Perco, and I'm a Flojo application scientist uh, giving today's presentation. If I could just do a quick sound check and if someone could let me know if they can hear me, um, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you can see my screen. Yes, yes we can. Chris said, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher. Okay. All right. So you're good to go. I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning to everybody here in the audience and as, uh, welcome also all of you joining us virtually today. Um, as I just said, my name is Veronica Obregon Perco and I'm a Flojo application scientist uh, with BD. I've uh, been in this role for about two months now. So this is one of my maiden voyage trainings. So if at the end you want to give me some harsh feedback, that's totally fine. <laughs> so, but I really appreciate you all uh, being here with me today. Um, so today's session has been geared more so for those that are new to Flojo usage or those that are just looking for a refresher on the software. So I thought I would just get started um, with a few things. Uh, first, uh, learning how to advance my slide would be nice. Um, and so this is just a quick outline of what I'm planning to cover. So in today's presentation, we're going to cover adding and organizing samples into a workspace, viewing plots and drawing gates, creating tabular and graphical reports, and generating a template. Now, what I thought it'd also be helpful to say, what I'm not planning to cover, doesn't mean I can't answer your questions about it or cover it um, after the presentation, um, but I just wanted to be upfront. Um, some people aren't on the edge of their seat waiting for these topics, um, if that's why they joined. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about sample QC or plugin installation, um, nor am I going to go through a compensation workflow because that's a pretty loaded workflow in itself and could take almost an hour just on that topic. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and focus more on the user interface and just some basic strategies on the software. Um, however, if I believe these sessions are being recorded and we did get a nice overview on some of these topics from Christian yesterday. So if you have access to that recording or would like access to previously recorded webinars, I'm happy to direct you to those. And speaking of other resources, I also wanted to just take a quick opportunity to talk about Flojo University. So although we offer this software, we also offer a lot of tools to help you use the software as well. So we don't wanna just hand you the product and leave you uh, to your best of luck, but we wanna provide you all of the tools and resources that you need to be successful with the software. Um, and so this comes in four main forms. We provide documentation, Flojo University, uh, which are just short sound bites of various tutorials, we also have webinars and you can also contact tech support. Um, so I just want to take a quick opportunity to show you where you can find all of those resources. So if you go to flojo.com, it's taken me to the exchange, but if you're on the Flojo website and you come up to the uh, menu bar at the top and go over to the learn tab, this is where you can find all the information <clears throat> that I was just talking about. So if you go over to Flojo software help, <clears throat> You can see that we have a lot of documentation on different features, anything from installation to troubleshooting your plugins. So this is going to be a very rich resource for those of you that are more reading inclined. Um, if you're short on time and you just want a quick walkthrough of some of these common workflows, you, you can head over to Flojo University, pick your product of choice, and then you've got a couple of different topics here. So uh, before you even download Flojo, if you want just a quick lesson on flow cytometry, um, there's also uh, getting started in Flojo, tips and tricks, all the way down to high parameter analysis. So lots of great short couple of five, 15 minute videos there. We also have uh, webinars that we host, uh, I think a couple of times a month. Um, you can see we have another intro to Flojo coming up in a few weeks on October 7th. And we also have more advanced topics, including sample quality, um, high dimensional workflow. Um, and so these are live. So if you re pre-register for them, you can ask questions during the event. But if you're short on time, you, don't, you can't join a live event. We also record all of the webinars and they're typically posted by the next day. Um, so if you wanna just look through our library of previously recorded webinars, you can also learn a lot of information from those. So you can see we have previously recorded webinars on intro to Flojo, um, intro to SeatGeek, high dimensional tools, high dimensional tools for rare cell detection. So a lot of great roughly one hour webinars and a lot of them also have some kind of a demo portion as well. 
Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to point out those resources. And last um, but not least, if you are completely stuck and you're having some kind of issue, um, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, tech support is very helpful um, with any issue, no issue too small or big. Um, our motto is we don't want you to struggle with anything for more than a few minutes. <laughs> so if you feel like you're stuck on something, please shoot us an email at flowjoybd.com or email me directly and I'll make sure that we get your issues resolved. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started. Um, I don't really have any slides beyond the outline that I showed you, just because I think Flojo is best learned um, when you're just using it <laughs> instead of showing a bunch of screenshots that maybe not or don't make a lot of sense without some kind of context. So let's just go ahead and get started. So first thing I wanna do is just give you an orientation of the Flojo workspace. So when you open Flojo, the first thing that'll open is a blank workspace. And just to give you an orientation here, we have the activity ribbon where you can have all of your functions, very much like a Microsoft Windows type application. Um, so you can uh, see that they're divided into different tabs. So in the first tab, you'll have kind of all of your more file actions. So creating a new workspace, adding samples, making groups. And then if you go over to your uh, workspace tab, you'll have a little bit more of the analytical tools um, and let's see what else I want to point out here. Um, so this is in the activity bar. And then if you come down here, this is where all of your groups will be once you start creating groups and we'll talk about what that is. And then down here is where you have all of your samples listed and where your population hierarchy will start to populate once you start making your gates and start adding some statistics. The other thing I want to point out is the preferences button. So it's a little heart button uh, within the workspace. And this is a great area to add some customization to your Flojo workspace. You can modify things like the font. Um, if you think the font's a little too small, a little too big, you can change those. You can change the color if you'd like. And same with the axis labels. If you decide you just don't want the text to be that big, you can certainly customize those. And if you go to gates, you can even change the color of your gates once they're formed. You can add a little tint to them. You can say, oh, I want the percentage uh, annotation to be above or below or inside the gate. So anything that you previously found annoying about <laughs> Flojo when you were making a gate, chances are you can turn it on or off in your preferences. So if you have any more questions about that, um, please just let me know. But there's pretty much everything is uh, very customizable within the Flojo workspace. Um, also want to point out the uh, Oops, that's the wrong one. The license information. So this is where you'll have your serial number um, or your portal uh, license. Um, so you always want to make sure those are up to date if you're having any kind of authentication issues. Um, so that's another uh, useful area of the Flojo workspace as well. You can also do some cytometry configuration. So if you want to adjust scaling for your instrument, um, so that it auto scales. So if you have an instrument like say the Aurora, which tends to have very bright values, um, maybe you wanna make it automatically so those values um, are say go to 10 to the sixth versus 10 to the fifth for a BD instrument. So a lot of customization settings there, but I'm not gonna change anything today, <laughs> but just know that you can change it if you'd like to. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and start loading some samples into the workspace. So Flojo is going to read FCS files, um, which is the typical output from any kind of a flow cytometry instrument. And so there's a couple ways you can add a sample. You can either use the add samples button, which will basically just open up your file explorer so you can add them manually. Um, the way I typically do it is just a drag and drop. A lot of Flojo has drag and drop functionality. So I'm just gonna do it that way. Head over, grab some data, and let's just load that in. So you can add them one by one. If you there's some that you don't want to add, um, you can drag in entire folder if you'd like to. So I'm just going to select all the FCFs files in my folder, drag them here into the workspace. And you can see that they populated here uh, within the workspace. So you can see the name of the file as it was made during acquisition. And you can also see number of cells, which is going to be your event number for that file. And you can see right now the statistic column in the middle is blank um, because we don't have any gates or statistics that we've added yet. But once we do, they'll start to populate within that column. All right, so now that we've uh, loaded our samples, let's talk 
about a little of what we're seeing here. So uh, one thing you could do is if you're not sure what these samples are, maybe they were given to you by a collaborator or a, a long ago rotation student and you don't remember what these files are, if you just right click the, the FCS file in question, you can hit inspect and get just a wealth of information from this uh, sample. You can see when it was acquired, what kind of instrument it was acquired on, and any other uh, keywords that are of interest. Tube name, if they got named, uh, lasers, you can see the parameters from the run. Um, but uh, one of the more important uh, pieces of information is you can start to get some information about the quality of your samples. So shown here is a plot with a parameter over time and the stability of the signal within that parameter. Um, so within the uh, dashed line is one standard deviation. Within the dotted line is two standard deviations. So we typically want our sample to be within two standard deviations um, from the rest of the data. And so you can see some of these look a little crazy, but they're, they're still within that dashed line. You can't see the dotted lines. So that's what that information means. If you just want to have an idea of the stability of your signal, during acquisition, and you can start to see if there's maybe some red flags in the sample. So you can inspect them manually, but also if you go over to tools, check sample quality, you'll see that there's a little circle next to each of your samples. And because I already manually inspected this one, the circle turned blue. So the color within those circles is going to give you an indication of the quality of your sample based on those line graphs that I just showed you. So you can have blue, which I believe is best and uh, reflects a very smooth acquisition. It can progress to green, which is smooth, so still good. And then it can progress to uh, pink and red, um, which is irregular and problematic. So if you have samples with those color indicators, you might wanna take a look make a time gate, maybe it excludes some areas, or use one of our cleanup algorithms to try to figure out what that anomaly is. So if you hit check sample quality, it's going to go ahead and just check all of the samples for you, give you a quick little readout of the quality of your samples. And we can see that these are all in pretty good shape, but you might have a couple stragglers where some might be pink or red, might want to take a deeper look at those. Okay. And then the other question you may have is, um, what is this box next to the sample? So the box next to the sample indicates the compensation matrix. So if there is a gray box next to your sample, that means the sample was compensated during acquisition. And you can see my compensation controls don't have a box because my compensation controls are not compensated, <laughs> but the samples have a compensation matrix. If you created a compensation matrix, which I'm not gonna go over today, but let's say you had and applied it to your samples, it would turn the color of the compensation matrix. So if you made a compensation matrix and made it purple, applied it to your samples, this gray box would then be purple. And so this way you can see which compensation matrix has been applied to your samples. All right, so I think that's it for the layout of the workspace. Um, so let's talk about organizing the workspace. So there's a lot of information here. So I, I've got, you know, dozens of files, fortunately somewhat alphabetized, but it can start to get a little unruly. And you can imagine if you had a lot, it'd be a little overwhelming if you're trying to go through all of these files. Kind of like having all those icons on your desktop, right? <laughs> Some folders are good. Too many icons on your desktop, you get a little lost sometimes. Um, so uh, you can see in the compensation group, so we have an all samples group, which has all 46 of the SCS files that I dragged in. Then we also have a compensation group, um, which automatically populated with my compensation controls. So how did Flojo do that? Flojo is pretty smart software, and our goal is to try and streamline workflow as much as we can. So the compensation group is created automatically, and it will automatically populate compensation controls if they have the word comp in it. Um, I believe it also does it if it has the word bead in it. And you can configure this. So if you name your compensation controls something different, you can modify the properties of your compensation group so they always automatically end up there. But without having to change a thing, when you freshly install Flojo, it will already do this for you. But you can certainly modify it if you want. Um, but what about the rest of the samples, right? So it, it automatically populated my, my comp controls, but I still have all these other samples. Like what, how can I organize those, kind of make them into some different groups? 
So groups are a very nice tool in Flojo because you can automate an entire analysis within a group and apply analysis to a group. So, so it's not just an organization tool, but it's also going to help with automated gating um, later on down in the analysis. Um, so I highly recommend making groups or at least make, making a group for your samples. So let's talk about making groups. So we've added our samples. So we can create a group using the add group button, just looks like a plus symbol. You go ahead and hit that button. You're gonna get a dialogue box here that is hidden behind my Zoom controls. How do I, whoops, is there a way to minimize the Zoom controls? Uh, there we go, thank you very much, Andrea. All right. So now that I can actually access my dialog box here. So this is a dialog window that will open when you're creating a group. And so you can see we have a compensation group, but maybe I want to make a different group. So looking at my files, I see I have a lot of FMO samples or fluorescence minus one samples. Maybe I want to put those all in a group because their analysis is going to be a little bit different. So let's name this group FMO. You can change the color if you want. You don't like blue, maybe you like uh, green. You can go ahead and change that color if you want to. You want it to be bold, italic, bold, italic. Let's just go with bold. And live group, we want to leave that box checked if we want to do the automatic application to our gating, which we'll be doing later. So I recommend leaving that checked. So you can create your group. And you can see it's empty right now. So a couple ways to add samples to your group. You can, of course, again, as Flojo is equipped to do this, drag and drop. All right, I've got one FMO sample there. I can multi-select them and drag them all in. But what if they weren't all in a nice alphabetical order like this? And I'd have to be selecting every other file, might get a little cumbersome, or you want something just a little bit faster if you're making a template or you're just a little short on time. So the other thing you can do with these groups, if you double click the group to modify it, you can create uh, basically membership criteria for this group. And you can tell the Fojo, this is what I want to go in this group, much like what it does with the compensation group already. So you can do that down here, where you can change this to file URI, which is the file path, or you can use dollar sign file name, contains FMO. Okay. Apply changes. And look at that, all of my FMO samples have now magically appeared in my FMO group. Saves you a little bit of drag and drop time, right? Now let's do it one more time. I've also got these uh, samples down here. Any suggestions for membership criteria? What, can I, what could I use to make a group for those? Yep, even just LD, right? Yeah, why not? So pretty simple. So just look at your samples and think about something that a, a criteria that they all have. Oh, that's the wrong button. Sorry about that. Let's create a group. All right, and let's just call these uh, CBMC. Leave it blue. All right, contains LD. And there we go. Now I have my PBMC group with all 20 samples. So again, all your samples will always be in all samples. <laughs> the compensation controls will be in compensation unless you move it otherwise. And then you can create groups for the rest of your samples. And you can always keep track of uh, how many samples you have within your group. You can also assign it a role. So for instance, my FMO group, right now it says role none, but you could certainly change that and say, you know, actually this, uh, this group is a uh, control group of some kind. Um, so you can change that here under the name of the group. Control, apply changes. So this is just one way you can organize your workspace, get a lot of information from it, um, especially if you've uh, walked away from the analysis for a long time, kind of want to reorient yourself. So speaking of reorienting yourself, um, so another way we can organize the workspace is to create keywords. So keywords are a very nice way to kind of annotate your samples without having to create such long file names, right? Sometimes we wanna put so much information in our file name, but the more complicated you make your file names, the harder it's gonna to be to see them in your workspace. And also sometimes it can also complicate Flojo's ability to find them when you've stored them in a, a strange location. So keywords are a good way to organize the workspace, but also give you a sense of what uh, is even in your workspace and what that sample is. 
So let's go ahead and talk through uh, making keywords. So if you go over to, I'm always trying to find an optimal place for this uh, toolbar, but I feel like I'm just gonna end up moving it a lot. So if you go over to the workspace tab, hit add keyword. And this is where you can add some kind of keyword to denote your samples, right? So here um, it looks like I've got live donor one, you know, live donor two, four, 12, 14. So maybe one keyword I wanna make is a uh, donor. So I've got donor here as a keyword, but I don't have anything as a label. So that's the name of my keyword, but I have to say uh, what that category is, right? So it's like if I bought a bag of candy, this is candy, but it could have chocolate in there. It could have Starburst. Starburst are my absolute favorite. If anybody has Starburst, I will take them as payment at the end of this training. Um, but if you do not, we will move on with the keywords. So here's the donor keyword. So. You can populate these manually. So if I want to call my, my live donor one, you know, donor one, oh, you can do something like that and, and name the rest of them, you know, donor two, donor three, donor four. So you can certainly go through, input them all manually. Doesn't seem that hard if you only have maybe a dozen samples. However, again, let's picture that you have 100 samples here and they're not all in, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to want to sit there and input donor one a hundred times or donor one 50 times and donor two a thousand times. So another way this can be automated is to create a keyword value series. So add keyword, which we've already done. And from this keyword, I want to make a keyword value series. Okay. So you're going to go over to the keywords tab in this dialog window select the keyword you want to make the series from. So this is when it comes in handy to put an asterisk before your created keyword. So I found it strange before and I couldn't figure out why people were doing it when I watched these tutorials. But it's because Flojo is going to do uh, basically an alphabetical uh, uh, or alphanumerical uh, sorting of your of keywords that the if were acquired during acquisition and also any that you made. So if you proceed all of your uh, custom keywords with an asterisk, they'll all end up right under the dollar symbols. If you just call it donor, it's gonna be somewhere with the Ds. If you make one called stim, it's gonna be down there with the Ss, right? You want them all in one place, put a symbol before it. Asterix is the recommendation um, and you can uh, have them all in one place. All right, so I made one called donor. Let's go ahead and do that also, I think, yeah, okay. So I have one called donor. So now I can start to make my series. So you can make these numerical or you can make them uh, alphabetic if you'd like. Um, let's in this case just say, let's just name them what they are, live donor one, live donor two, live donor three, or actually I had live donor one, two, and four, and live donor 12, and live donor 14. One, two, four, 12, 14, great. So I've made the, the labels that I wanna make. I have 20 values in this group. So I'm gonna fill 20 values starting with the current sample. I'm gonna use the value four times before moving to the next value, right? Cause look at over at my list. I have live donor one, four times, live donor two, four times, live donor four, four times. So that's what this means. Use the value four times before moving to the next one. And it even gives you a little preview down here. So you don't have to hit the button and be like, oh, that's not what I wanted. So you can see the series populating at the bottom as a little preview. Hit OK. And look at that. Now I have a keyword for my donors, which I could have named something else. Um, if you had, maybe you wanted to give it a different name, like donor one through four, donor A through D. Um, so you can have that there. Um, so another keyword we could do is, so I have a couple donors here, but within each donor, I've got maybe some different conditions. I've got condition uh, A, uh, condition C, condition B, condition D, right? So if you have maybe different stimulation conditions. So let's walk through that one. So I wanna add a keyword, call it, uh, let's call it treatment, hit okay. Now. I'm going to make a keyword value series. Treatment. 
treatment. All right, and so for my different treatments, I'll have maybe treatment, uh, let's say I'll have uh, unstim, and I'll have maybe, uh, maybe pre-stim, uh, actually that looks like a post, so let's call that post-stim, and we'll call this a pre-stim, and maybe a both stim. Here's my keywords populating down here. So now in this case, I, uh, I'm not going to repeat the value because I have these four different conditions. So unlike the donor where we repeated live donor one four times, this is not repeating because I want it to fill the sequence as it is. So we use the value one time before moving to the next one. Okay, hit okay. Oops, didn't do the rest of them. I think I forgot to change it to 20, but if you had changed it, then it would do this same uh, series uh, following down there. Okay. So this is just some ways that you can organize your workspace and be able to even sort by a particular condition if you needed to do that. Okay, so now we've talked about uh, workspaces. So let's maybe talk about some gating now. So if we go into our, uh, I'm gonna just uh, minimize this a little bit so we have a better view. And I'm going to hide some of these just so we can see better. All right, so here's our workspace. So now we'll talk about some gating. So to get your gating started, um, you would just double click on an FCS file. Oops. There you go. And so it's going to open up a plot window. Drag this here. There we go. All right. Let's make that a little bit bigger. All right, and so typically when you open an FCS file for the first time, the view you'll get is uh, some kind of scatter plot. Typically it's forward scatter uh, by side scatter just by default, um, but depending on your gating strategy, you can change those to whatever you want your first parameter to be. The other default view is the pseudo color plot. So again, all of this will be customizable and I can go through that as we go along. But let's say for starters, I wanted to make a uh, gate to exclude my doublets. So typically your forward scatter area and your forward scatter height should be proportional to one another. So anything that falls outside that proportion is probably two cells or a couple cells stuck together. So we wanna exclude doublets first. So when you open up your plot, change this to uh, your desired parameters. If you wanna use width instead of height, you can do that. Um, and then we're looking at a pseudo color plot. So the uh, hotter color, so the more red color indicates density. Um, and so if you have a more bluish color, so that's a little bit more density. And then the dark blue is gonna be more low density events. Um, so uh, in terms of gating, there's a couple options here. So you could make um, a rectangular gate, which you can see doesn't really maybe help me in this kind of a gating situation. Um, you could also do a quad gate, which basically cuts the plot into four uh, uh, quadrants and you can move those quadrants around. So again, well, maybe this isn't gonna be the best gate for what I need here. So let's go ahead and undo that gate. Um, the other option you have is a kind of an elliptical gate, or makes kind of just like a, an oval shape. So maybe something like this might be okay because um, you could, you know, squish it down or squish it around like that. Um, but I'm gonna clear that one for now. Yes. All right. Um, and then you can also, which I think is gonna be the best situation here is use a polygon gate. So a polygon gate is where you can basically customize the shape and end a segment uh, with a click. Okay? So I'm, I have a click here to start my gate. And then I come up, click, click, click and click to close, okay? And then it's gonna auto name the population sometimes depending on what parameters you have on the X and Y axis. But again, you can certainly change it. So in this case, I'm gonna call this singlets. All right, and for some of you who have used Flojo before, you might be saying, whoa, why is her gate so dark? <laughs> why is it so bold? Why is her text so bold? You can change all that in your preferences, okay? So for those of you that are new to the audience, you know, go over to preferences, fonts, gates. This is where you can customize all of those settings. Right? I have them 
rather huge and rather dark <laughs> so for the sake of demos. And you can certainly change it to a different color too. All right, so you can see when I made it this gate, two things happen. One is population name populated right above the gate or inside the gate, if that's what you have your preferences set. It put the frequency of what's inside the gate relative to the rest of the events on the plot. And it populated the gate name under the sample where I did the analysis. And you can see the sample is live because it has this dark blue diamond. Okay, So I made the gate and it populated here, gave me a statistic now, which is basically the frequency of this population within this gate, within this plot. Okay? So you can see that there's some things happening in the background as you're making these gates. Okay? Also, if you go to active gate, you can also get some counts as well. And you can see the same value here, active gate 90.3% singlets. Yeah. All right, so now we've done our singlets gate. So I want to make my next gate now. So how do you get to the next one? Well, you can double click the plot here. All right, so maybe, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, you certainly can. Yeah, that was just a matter of taste. If you wanna, you wanna extend it. Yeah, you definitely can. I also I left out a little population here just because my mouse was misbehaving. But <laughs> so yeah, you can certainly extend it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the question from the audience, in case the uh, virtual audience can hear, was uh, the extension of the singlets gate, and I was just demonstrating that I you know made the gate quickly just for a demo. But yes, you can certainly extend it um, if you need to do that or if you would like to do that. Okay. So now maybe I want to find uh, my mononuclear cells and my lymphocytes. You know where are those guys residing? So let's change that to forward scatter, side scatter. So again, use your choice of, of appropriate gate here. Um, and the other thing maybe I'll take an opportunity to talk about here is uh, different views of your uh, plot window. Um, so here we're looking at pseudocolor, which again is, is a bit of a, a color density uh, plot, um, but you can also change it to contour plot, um, which basically creates radial lines to represent the density of the populations. You can do zebra plot, um, which kind of reminds me of a, a density plot, contour plot hybrid. Um, so you can still see the rings here, but you also get some indication of uh, density. Um, pseudocolor we already talked about. Density plot, so rings not as clear, but maybe it's like a black and white version of a pseudocolor plot. Um, you can also uh, change some uh, different settings. So like in the pseudocolor plot, you know, you can more appreciate the resolution of each of the dots. Um, but if you want to smooth, you can smooth them out and you know, change the view a bit. So depending what you're gating, might wanna change views around just to see what's gonna help you make your best gate. So a couple of different view options there. So I'm gonna stick with pseudo color in this case and uh, go ahead and use my polygon gate again. Okay. So maybe I'll call these uh, MNC for mononuclear cells. Okay, so there's my uh, second gate there. So let's keep going. Want to go into mononuclear cells. Uh, maybe now I want to exclude um, my dead cells, right? If you have some kind of a live dead uh, die, some kind of viability die, um, you can do that. Um, so now I'll take this opportunity to talk about two different things. One is a different view. So let's say you're, you know, I'm having a little trouble with this. I can't really tell where you know the two populations are. So you can instead of pseudocolor look at the histogram. Okay. So that's another way to make that gate. Now keep in mind, if you have a histogram, you can only visualize a 1D plot. No, you can't do 2D or you can't have two parameters for a histogram, but uh, you can look at one parameter on the x-axis here. So maybe that improves your view a little bit for this particular gate. Um, but let's say you weren't satisfied with that. Like, well, I, I, I feel like I still have some extra white space here and I, I don't really feel like I'm getting good resolution. Well, you can also adjust the scale of your plot view. Okay, so that's going to be in the transform button. So T for transform. This is where you can adjust the scaling of your view. So you hit that button, customize axis, and it's going to open up this dialog and give you an interactive way to change your scaling. So maybe I don't like that that has too much space. Well, I'll just you know, hit that minus button, give it a little bit more room if I wanted to do that. Um, maybe I don't like the space over here. 
So you can also play with adjusting the view that way with basis. Um, and you can also, so this is the bi-exponential view. So bi-exponential is essentially a way to compress the, the uh, lower end of the scale so that we can maximize the range of the higher end of the scale. But if you don't like that, um, you think you'd rather just do a, a traditional logarithmic scale, you can change it to logarithmic. Maybe get rid of some of the white space over there. Okay. Um, you can also change it to a linear, which doesn't usually fit data very well, um, but that option is there. There, um, more. It's, I think it has more utility for categorical uh, gates when we go back to our keywords. Um, there's also arc sine h transformation, hyper, uh, hyperlog, um, Miltenyi, uh, I guess specifically for files coming from those instruments. Um, so a lot of different options here to just improve your view if you don't like the view that you have. Okay? And you can change a bunch of them at the same time. So if you've realized, you know what, pretty much all my parameters, I want them to be stopped at 10 to the fourth. You could pick a few of these go ahead and change them now, hit apply. They'll apply to your views um, as you're going through your analysis. So I have my uh, plot here. So I'm gonna go ahead and opt for the uh, histogram view in this instance. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of gating, so when you have a histogram view, you've got two more options for gating. You can do a range gate. So I'm gonna just go ahead and pick those and use the range gate. From my live. All right. So, are there any questions so far, virtual or otherwise? All right. So, I'm going to make maybe one or two more gates just so we can get this population hierarchy and get a good look at all the different gating strategies. Um, but again, you can see that this gating strategy is populating here in our workspace, right? We made singlets from singlets, we made mononuclear cells, which is why it's offset from singlets. From mononuclear cells, we got our live cells, which is why it's offset from mononuclear cells. Um, so maybe the other uh, marker we want to do now is uh, some CD3 T cells, right? So since I'm only interested in single positive CD3, I'm going to go ahead and just leave it as a, a histogram gate. So let's hit well, let's say CD3 T. All right. And then the last gate I'll go ahead and make is one for CD4 and CD8 cells. And so that way I can talk about two other gates quickly as well as another view. So let's go ahead and change this to CD4 and CD8. Okay, so in this situation, since maybe you're, you might be interested in your double positive cells or your double negative cells, maybe you'd wanna use a quad, or some kind of quadrant weight. Um, and so you can use the quadrant gate that uh, I showed earlier, which basically uh, divides the plot into four um, 90 degree angle quadrants. Um, and you can also move around after you've set the gate, you can move around the, you know, each of the legs of the quadrant if you'd like to. But the other more accurate way to um, create kind of a quad gate like that is to use these curly quads here. So you might notice they have kind of a, a weird shape to them. You know, why do they, why are they not straight? So this kind of a quad gate is accounting for spreading error. So this is um, an error that's just unavoidable with flow cytometry. It can be worse if you have more spillover, if you didn't do proper compensation. But even if you have, I'm sorry? Yes, to the virtual audience, please titrate your antibodies. <laughs> Lojo can't rescue improperly titrated antibodies. <laughs> but, and we also can't rescue spreading error, but we can account for it. So spreading error. So that uh, typically follows a ratio with just a, this calculation has taken into account for this gate. And so you can see that the, the gate kind of goes off to an angle a bit, like it's kind of crooked. And you can see that that accounts for, again, the spread of the data. So if you look at say your CD8 cells, how they're kind of following this slope here, right? And so that's what this gate is trying to capture when doing that. So it's trying to capture the slope of that data, you know, the slight spread into the other detector. And so you can move the center of the gate, but you can't adjust the legs because they've already been placed there to account for proper spreading error. Okay. So this is probably the more accurate way to uh, look for single positive or double positive populations or things like that. Um, so just something to keep in mind for uh, when you're making your gates and doing your impressive analysis. Okay. 
Um, so uh, one might be wondering like, well, ew, I don't like the names that were given there. You can rename them. Head over to your plot, right click, rename, quadrant one. Those are my CD8 T cells. Quadrant two, you can also hit control R, get the same function. Quadrant two could be my double positive T. Quadrant three, gonna be my CD4. And here we have my double negatives. All right? So you can rename any population if you've misspelled it or if you don't like the auto names that come when you do some kind of a quad gate, okay? All right, so let's see. Now let's go back to um, applying gates. So we've done all these gates. And when I was first showing an undergrad how to do these gates, they said, oh my gosh, I now have to do this for every file here. And I said, well, not quite. So luckily, and again, this is the beauty of groups. I've created my PBMC group which contains my 20 samples uh, for this analysis that I was just doing. Let's go ahead and collapse that singlets gate, drag it up to my group, and boom, all that analysis is now populated in each of my samples in that group. Okay. Now, one thing you might wanna do, so go through and check the gates. It's not gonna maybe necessarily place them in the appropriate place. You're gonna have variability between donors, between mice, monkeys, whatever uh, you're studying. Um, so a quick way, to do that is, um, you know, you could do this in a layout editor, of course, and I'll show that in a second. But if you open up all your plots, or maybe open up a couple at a time, um, as long as you have that group selected in your workspace, so let's go back to the workspace, got that group selected, hold down the shift key. And while holding down the shift key, hit the right green arrow button. And it's gone to my next sample. Now that will only work if you hold the shift key. I can't stress that enough. You don't hold the shift key, it's only going to go to the next sample for the plot you're looking at. Okay, so hold the shift key, push the green arrow, and you can now go through. <laughs> it's a very excited person outside. Um, you can uh, then go through each of your samples and adjust all of your gates. Okay? So saves you a little bit of time in terms of at least uh, drawing all of the gates. Okay. So and then I guess I should point out since I'm already here, the uh, upward arrow and downward arrow navigations, that's to go up a gate. So here, I wanna go up a gate. That was my live gate. I wanna go up a gate. There's my mononuclear cells. So these are just your navigation buttons. So up, down, take you up the population hierarchy. Left, right, take you between samples. You hold the shift key when you go left, right. You'll go between samples for all of your open plot windows. You don't, it's only gonna go to the next sample for your active plot window. Okay. All right, so I think with our last um, couple minutes here, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about making uh, making layouts and making statistics. So I'm trying to, question? Yes, the gating in the lower right, is huh? that a different shape? The gating on the right? Oh yeah, this is the curly quad one for spreading error. Sure. Oh, yeah, below the help button. Help button. In that, in the, yeah, right. Here. Where your mouse up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Under a different gate. I'm sorry. I guess I'm. It's above the graph. Two dimensional plot you have open. Yeah. You go to the, up to the top and select the swirly gate option. Mm -hmm. If you go up that help button right there, you can go to the right. So more right back. There. Oh, is this a different one? Yes, sorry. Um, yes, that's a different kind of gate. So let's see. I wonder if I open another plot, if I can. Uh, so it basically makes a curly quad. It's like a spider gate. Um, but that one, you can adjust the uh, the legs of the spider. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I was going to try and open up. Uh, maybe let's see. All right. There you go. So. There you go. So you can't adjust the legs per se, but you, you can do this kind of fun motion if you want to. <laughs> All right. All right. 
Good question. Yes. So sorry, the question in the audience that I was struggling to uh, find the function for um, was what was that other uh, curly looking gate besides the curly quad? So that's a spider gate. That one does allow you some motility. Yeah, no problem. All right. So yeah, let's go on to, to uh, let's maybe talk about tables before we talk about the layout. So you know, you do all this analysis. Um, ultimately, you're going to want some kind of numbers to come out of your experiment, whether they be frequencies, medium fluorescent intensities of some of your activation markers, et cetera. Um, so you can get all of that tabular information uh, within Flojo and then export it um, to some kind of uh, external uh, table software like Excel or Prism if you want to do some statistics. So if you go over to this grid-like symbol, that's your table editor. So this is basically going to be your canvas for adding your uh, statistics of interest. Okay, so there's a couple of ways you can add them. So let's say, for instance, um, within this workspace, I had a statistic that I wanted to add. So maybe I'm interested in the median fluorescent intensity of perforin. Okay, so there's my statistic there, which you can drag into your table if you'd like. And you know, one question I get is if you have to apply this to all of your samples in that group, you certainly can if you just want to see it in the workspace. But as I'm going to show you in a second, you can also, when you drag in a statistic into your table uh, editor, you can ask the table to get that same statistic for all of your samples. So you can add it to your samples if you want to see it immediately, but you can get it um, almost immediately when you are making your table. Okay. So the other way you can get a statistic in your table editor is to go to add column. And here you can add your stat. Okay, so maybe here I want to call it perforin MFI. And here I've got median. Pick my sample. Pick my population. Hit OK. All right now it's given me a name for that table. Also realized I forgot to say parameter. Really, come on. Oops. There it is. Sorry, my double click function was uh, failing me here. Um, and so the other, uh, let's say another statistic you want to add is the frequency of a particular cell type, right? So you can say um, add column frequency of um, CD8 T cells, and you can either grab it from the ancestor um, or you can grab it from another population. So maybe you want to know, well, I want to know how many CD8 T cells are in all of my live mononuclear cells or all of my singlets if you were going to do some kind of sorting and you just want to have an idea of how many cells are in there. So it will either automatically get it from the ancestor, which will in this case will be uh, CD3 cells, or you can change that if you wanted to. Yeah. So there's another statistic you can add. Okay. So you can add as many as you'd like, um, but once you're done, you can go back to your table editor. And this is where we're going to create a batch report, where you're basically going to tell this table, I want this information for all of the samples in the group that I tell you to get it from. Okay, so I have my table group. I want the PBMC group. And this is an iteration. So basically, that means what am I separating by? I want it to separate it by sample. But if you had made keywords, oh, I want it to separate it by donor. Because remember, we made each of our keywords before. Or I want to separate it by stimulation condition. You can do that too. Okay. So I'm going to leave it as sample right now. And then a couple options for the table. If you want to just see it immediately, you can hit display. You want to just immediately send it to some kind of file, then you can do that to file. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hit display for now. Um, but before I hit that, another cool tool. Um, actually, where's the uh, yep, display? Here we go. Get it. Visualize. Oh, why oh, my heat map's inactive? But let's just go ahead and create the table. So here's the table, create table. And I just realized I didn't make a perforating gate, which is why it doesn't have an MFI. <laughs> but if you had, it would have the median uh, statistic there. And then here's my frequency of uh, CD8 T cells from CD3 T cells that I had asked for it to do. And here's all of my different samples here. So you can get that stat that way. Um, if you were to make um, a file, you can say what kind of file you want. I want a CSV file. I want a text file. I want an Excel file. That's Excel is usually pretty popular. You can change um, where you want the table to go. Um, so it typically tries to put it in the folder where you opened the workspace or where you created the workspace. But you want to just put it on your desktop. You can do that. Hit save. Create table. 
when you hear the magic Flojo noise, there's the table. Great. There's all my values there. No perforin though, because I didn't make a perforin gate. <laughs> so, right. So those are just some ways you can get some statistics um, from Flojo. And I'm not sure why my, ah, here we go. So the other visualization you can do, and I'm going to go to change that back to display, visualize. And so you can pick, you know, which statistics you want to see this for. Let's just do frequency since I don't have any perforin. If you do heat map, See how this little flame symbol has populated within that parameter? Go to table editor, display, right? So these values are all roughly the same. So there's not a whole lot of color change, but this will basically be a blue yellow heat map. So if you were say looking at perforin and you wanna know, well, which sample had the most perforin? So that's gonna be more yellow. And then the lower values are gonna be blue. So this is like a cool way you can get a nice heat map view of your uh, tabular statistics as well. That's a really cool feature. I wish I'd known about it when I was a grad student. <laughs> um, okay, so that's it for tables. So let's quickly do um, a layout and then we'll talk about exporting the layout. I'll real quick touch on templates and then I'll wrap up um, and answer any questions you guys may have. Okay, so layout editor. So this basically opens blank canvas to which to make your report. Okay. So a couple things you can do in here. Um, one is you can just drag in your gates of interest. So let's say ultimately I was interested in showing my PI, all of my, uh, the frequency of my uh, different T cell subsets, CD4, CD8, double positive, double negative. Okay. So you can drag in any plot that you're interested in looking at. Um, one popular visualization is to show your, uh, your, your population hierarchy, right? Well, how did you get to these cells? You right click this, there we go. You right click, go to ancestry. And now it's showing me the ancestry of that population, right? I started with singlets, I went to mononuclear cells, I went to my live cells, and then I went to my CD3 T cells. So the other option is to drag them in manually, but this is a quick option. Question in the audience. Where do you have it in this format? Can you change the layout? Oh, I believe you can. Let's see. Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that for you. I know the main plot you can. I'm doing it right now, looking at it. I'm wondering if you did it for all of them, if it would. No, not quite. So that's a good question. Yeah, it, it appears you cannot. Um, but I guess if you really wanted to, you could go back into your samples, put it in the view you want, and then it should automatically do it in the last view that you had it. That's a good question. I don't think it makes a live tile, it's just a, an image. Now, if you really wanted to do that and have more power over it, take you a little longer, but you could drag in each of those gates manually from your uh, population hierarchy, and then you'd have the power to modify each of them. Um, but since we got a question about modification, let's go ahead and move on to that. So I dragged in my gate, so maybe I'm satisfied with the way this looks, um, but I don't, I don't like the way this looks. I don't want the contour plot. Well, I can double click on that, change it to back to pseudocolor. Um, I could do just a dot plot, and maybe change the color, right? Maybe I'd have a different color for each of my treatment groups or something like that. Um, let's say I don't, I don't like these axes. They're, they're too complicated. I, I just wanna know what the marker is. You can go over to annotate, change the label. I just want it to say CD4. I just want the y-axis to say CD8. Right, a little cleaner, right? You can also uh, change the set, the size of this font. You want it to be nice and big for a publication. Um, you can do uh, overlays as well. Um, so maybe one way to kind of show that is so like, let's say I wouldn't really expect a whole lot of difference here, but let's say I expected maybe one sample to have more double positive T cells, one donor over another. If I drag in over that same gate, I can just make an overlay. Right now I can see two different donor colors, compare them directly instead of having duplicates of those plots and sitting there with a magnifying glass trying to look at frequencies. And you can see it, I've gotten frequencies on the side here. Um, you wanna change these colors, you can do that too. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I don't think I've ever tried to do more than 30, but um, people do all kinds of crazy clustering analysis with like single cell seek. So I imagine it can handle quite a bit. Might stall on you for a quick second, but <laughs> I think it should work. Question in front uh, to the, from the audience to the virtual uh, listener. 
there's was um, you know is there a limit to how many you can overlay? Um, I can't say I know that there is one, um, but if anyone finds one that makes Flojo just totally crash, please share. <laughs> um, okay, so this is just another visualization you can do here. Um, let's see what else can we talk about. Uh, if you had, let's say, uh, you wanted to look at, we like, for instance, we made this perforin. Let's go ahead and just make a perforin gate. Oops. Yeah. And let's make it look like a, a histogram. Okay. So not a whole lot of perforin here, but just for the sake of argument, let's just make a gate here. All right, so if I had my uh, perforin gate, and maybe I wanted to see what that perforin looked like across my different samples, you can drag in this again from all of your uh, samples here. Let's say I wanna do this quick overlay, right? And so like you could see if I had some kind of activation, maybe that perforin gate would shift a little bit. If you wanna adjust that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you can move that around a bit. Um, and some other uh, tools you can use, and I'm going to bring this down just to make it a little bit easier. Object. There we go. Um, you can change like the foreground of the of the uh, plot. So let's say you want something that's going to look better um, on a particular slide color or something like that. So maybe that's not a great color, but <laughs> you get the idea. Maybe you want to do something on the, the gray family. You know, you're someone like me who likes dark mode. You're doing some kind of dark mode presentation. You can go ahead and, uh, you know, make the background look a little bit different. Um, you can do a gradient if you'd like. Um, change the weight, change the opacity. You can create a shadow. And you can rotate it a bit. So. A lot of fun stuff in here if you want to just change the way something looks. Yeah. So once you're satisfied with your report, you want to go ahead and export it and um, you know export it to some kind of PDF or something like that. Um, so one thing you can do before uh, exporting is you could um, scale to the page. So each of these dashed lines represents a page break. So maybe you want all of this information to be on one page. That way you don't print 15 sheets and make your floor admin upset when you print your report. Um, so once you're satisfied with it, you can go over to your layout editor. And much like when we batched our tables, we're going to batch the layout. So again, I'm telling it I want it to be with the PBMC group. Uh, I want it to iterate by sample. And it can either make a new layout, um, or if you want to just immediately get it into a PowerPoint or a PDF, you could do that. But usually people like to look at it first. You can say how many rows or columns you'd like. So hit Create Batch Report. Right. And so you can see it basically made that same uh, report for each of the samples in that group and it separated them. I guess it put two to a page, but if you wanted to separate each one on a page, you can make that a setting as well. Um, and so let's say now you want to go ahead and um, go here. So if you didn't want to make a new layout and you want to go ahead and make uh, a new batch report to some kind of file. So when you create the batch report, you can just change this to say PDF. Change your destination. I'm going to say the desktop just for right now. Create batch report. All right. All right, and there's my batch report. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to show in the layout editor. Possibilities are endless. I just want to stress that you can change colors, fonts, arrangements, um, the way the plot view looks if you want dot plot versus pseudo color. So a lot of power here to just get it the way you want it to look. Um, and so lastly, um, I'll go ahead and save my work here. So I went ahead and saved my workspace. So a note that your uh, workspace is basically just your skeleton for your analysis. And then the skeleton tries to find your data when you open the workspace again. So um, two other ways that you can save it. If you save as an archive file, an ACS file, it's basically gonna unify all of your analysis into one file. 
So instead of having your FCS files and your workspace separate, it's going to be one large file that has your FCS files and your workspace together. So it's a really nice way to share files with collaborators so you don't have to worry about the disconnection issue. If anyone's ever used Flojo before in the audience and you get the, the red X's of doom because you've uh, lost connection with your FCS files, this is a nice workaround for that. Makes the file a little larger, but a little easier to share between devices, between users. The other way you can save is as a uh, template, or I should say export as a template. So another question I've gotten in the past is if you have to do the same analysis again, so even if you, you can drag it up to your groups, that's still going to take a while if you have to apply those uh, changes all the time. So you can, after you've completely satisfied with your workspace, the population hierarchy, the way you have your layouts, the way you have your tables, the way you've named, colored, everything, you can save it as a template. And then when you open that template, it's basically going to be a skeleton for your analysis. When you drag in a sample, it's going to auto-populate everything. Gate names, layouts, a batch reports if you have the iteration on. So it's really a nice tool um, if it's analysis that you're just, same analysis you're just doing over and over again. Um, so I'd highly recommend it um, if you have some kind of a repetitive analysis. Um, so I believe that is all that I intended to cover um, for today. Um, I'll go ahead and put up my email um, and I'm happy to take any questions if, um, if anybody has any questions. And if there's anybody in the virtual audience with a question, please feel free to tap it, type it in the chat. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no questions, I'll just go ahead and leave my contact information up here. Um, thank you so much for attending today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to leave a stack of, uh, for those of you here in person, <laughs> leave a stack of uh, business cards here if you would like to take one, or please feel free to just uh, grab a picture of my email there. Um, and for those of you joining us in the afternoon, we'll be talking about a high parameter analysis for flow cytometry. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, um, please join us in the afternoon at 2 p.m. And thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>